Welcome to Guest of the Year. I'm the host. My name's Mike. This week's prize pack is provided by Shop Posta, which is run by former Guest of the Year contestant Peter. Peter is a painter, muralist, and visual artist from Connecticut. His love for the dead led him down a rabbit hole of vintage bootleg lot tees, which inspired him to start designing his own dead-themed t-shirts. All designs start with Peter's own illustrations done on pencil and paper. You can check out Peter's site at shop posta.com, which is also linked in the show notes. Thanks so much to Peter and to Mason, who curates the prize packs. All right, here's how the game works. We'll play the first part of a Grateful Dead live track, and each contestant will use the messaging system to silently guess which year the performance is from. Contestants, who are all on a video conference together, can message in their guesses at any time during the clip or in the 10 seconds after it concludes. Whoever is furthest in the correct year is eliminated. The last two deadheads standing will have a best of three series to determine a winner. The defending champion, Matteo, very understandably has abdicated his throne because he was waking up in the middle of the night to play because he's in Madrid. So we have five new deadheads competing for the title this week. So we'll meet those deadheads in a moment. But first, without further ado, the Grateful Dead. The guesses are in. It was Peggy O at Red Rocks Amphitheater on September 6th, 1983. So the only one to get it exactly was Jake. Jake is 45 from Stony Brook, New York. Jake, you nailed 83. That's a tough one, early 80s. How'd you figure it out? Well, the only thing for the last probably five to seven years that my daughters and I listen to in the car every day is early 80s Grateful Dead. It's off the rails. They're better musicians than they were in the 70s. It's the most raw, real stuff that you've ever heard in your life. Most cats don't get it. Jerry's voice is shredded for obvious reasons, but it's the only time of the dead that I, I can't stop listening to it because they get off the rails and we all fail in life. We all get up, dust ourselves off and keep going. And to me, like that's the greatest period of the dead because the 70s is too pretty, it's too perfect. You know, and quite frankly, they got to be better musicians. And in 83, Garcia was at the top of his game. If you listen to his guitar playing, he is going into the stratosphere. Brent was the best player, in my opinion, that the dead ever had. And so that was in my wheelhouse. I never heard that version. And it's very up-tempo. I was actually, but I could tell by Jerry's voice. And so, that you know, 83, baby. Thanks, Jake. You're on to the next round. Joining the next round is Garen. Garen guessed 1984. Garen is 50 and he's from Brooklyn. Garen, why 84? 
Um, the first thing that caught my ear was the Brent uh, synth tone. I think that I think that was the emulator uh, uh, keys, that, and that's the first thing that caught my eye. And then, um, yeah, the tempo, um, Bobby's tones. I mean, for me, one of the things I zero in on right away is sort of like what distinguishes each individual musician in each era, you know? And so, and each one of them, when you get into the mid eighties though, it's sort of a woolly dense thicket there where there were subtle changes from like 83 to 84, but you know, part, part of me was like, is that 85? But then Jerry's voice sounded a little bit too sweet to be 85, you know? Nice. Really nice. Um, you're on to the next round along with your husband, Jason, who guessed 1982. Jason is 49 from Brooklyn. Jason, why 82? I sort of immediately, you know, just aside from the obvious, like who's in the band, but I gravitated toward 1983. And what I'm getting into like 82, 83, 84, it's really, I listen for Jerry's voice. There's, as Gary was saying, it's maybe less, sweet as it gets a little bit later in the early mid 80s but there's also this thing where jerry had his head down uh for a lot of 1982 and 1983 and i sort of was thinking that that sounded just a little bit um a little bit before he seemed to zero out on his voice and kind of get down where his you know resting his chin on his chest so i kind of went okay i think that's 82 late 82 something like that Brilliant. Hearing the head on the chest. <laughs> That's awesome. You're on the next round. Mike also guessed 82, actually, which makes Chris the odd man out who guessed 78. Sorry, Chris. Mike, 82 as well. You're 25 and from Miami. Anything you want to add to Jason's breakdown there? No, I thought that was a good breakdown. I was going to say 83, so I should have gone with my gut there. Because by the end, I switched to 82 because I heard Brent was a little louder than I expected. I was going to go 83 at first because the that Peggio reminds me of the, I think it's 1231 San Francisco Civic Auditorium 83. Um, so New Year's 83, there's a great uh, Peggio on YouTube. And that fast plucking by Jerry, you know, that like up-tempo plugging it, plucking and the Peggio on Tiger and just how Tiger sounded, I knew it was 82 or 83, but should have gone if I got but Thanks, Mike. Chris is 40 from Altoona, Pennsylvania. You guessed 1978. Chris, what'd you hear? The sound was a little jumbled for me, and I couldn't hear any um, keyboard. At the very end, I thought I heard a couple fills of an acoustic piano. So I thought it had to be Keith, but um, Jerry sounded old enough that I thought 80s, but when I heard the acoustic piano at the very end, I just thought, I guess it's the last year of Keith. Got it. So how did you get into the dead, Chris? Um, mainly just at a young age. I had um I have an older sister and her friends were like the cool, you know, the cool kids and they listened to the dead and uh they took me to a dead show when I was twelve at um uh Three Rivers Stadium. And uh ever since then it's been my I, I rarely listen to anything besides Grateful Dead Mike. My poor girlfriend, that's, uh, you know, she's got to put up with me all the time. But yeah, that's, a, that's about it. Was that the 95 Three River show? Yeah, yeah, the rainy, the rainy show. What, yeah, West LA Fadeaways on YouTube. That's see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, what do you remember from that show? Like, what, uh, what was that like? Um, I think it was in the second set. It just started downpouring and they played a bunch, they played Mission in the Rain samba in the rain and looks like rain <laughs> there was a ton of it had stopped raining for like maybe 10 minutes and then bobby started playing looks like rain and it immediately started raining again and probably 15 people around me were crying and i was i was 12 so i was like what is going on right now you know but i figured it out eventually uh you have a cool older sister it reminds me of the almost famous older sister <laughs> kind of something like that Thanks, everyone. It's fun. I love the show. I'll hang out, too, and uh, good luck to all y'all. Thanks, Chris. So Jason, Garen, Mike, and Jake are on to the next round. Let's hear the next song.
So it was Brown Eyed Women at Fox Theater on October 18th, 1972. <laughs> Everyone has a collective shake of the head because actually no one got it. We had three 73s and 174, and Mike is the odd man out. I'm sorry, Mike. <laughs> He's head and hands over here. Let's start with Jason. Uh, why 73? Why 73? I think that I was listening to an interplay in the rhythm section that just reminds me of that summer tour in 73. I, I was leaning towards 74 more than 72, actually. But um, for some reason, there, it was in the mix. I think it was ultimately came down to this feels like a lot of the 73 shows that I liked a lot. And so I just kind of took a stab at it. But uh, I w was going to be 73 or 74, so I'm glad it went this way and not the other. <laughs> Garen, were you thinking something similar? You know, so first thing is, when did brown-eyed women enter the repertoire? Obviously, start there. And so I was like, okay, 72 and beyond. And then um, I was actually listening for, in the wall of sound, when they had those out-of-phase microphones and they had that sort of, that really not ideal vocal sound going on. Um, it's almost like a staticky kind of lispy kind of thing that was happening. And I thought I heard that. And so I thought, okay, so this is maybe not 72. Uh, and then I actually, for a minute there, and I'm not really sure, I was like, was the wall of sound introduced in 73 or 74? I couldn't remember at the moment. So I went with 73. Well, you're on the next round. Jake, you're also on the next round. Why did you guess 73? Easy, easy. Kreutzmann, it's only one drummer. And, uh, and they sound happy. Uh, 74 was a, a bitter end. They took all the year off. And then in 75, all the cats in the band realized they couldn't survive without the dead. So um, 73 was very upbeat, single drummer. And uh, they're having a ball. They were happy. Nice poll, Jake. Mike, you guessed 74. I'm sorry. Talk us through your thought process. Uh, yeah, what are you thinking? I was about to put 73. Like, I should have just been doing this off the rip right away. <laughs> I thought I, <laughs> I thought of it like 73, 74 Pacific Northwest uh, shows, you know, that brown eyed women, the at PNW Coliseum, I think. Um, so I just knew it was 73 or 74. Well, it's actually the end of 72, but I thought it was 73 or 74 based on the sound. Um, should have gone with 73, but you guys are good. You guys are well versed. So. Sorry, Mike, that's a tough one. How do well, you how did you get into the dead? Um, I kind of got into the dead slowly in high school. I had like, you know, some studio dead, just like acoustic, friend of the devil, uh, ripple type stuff. And then like senior year of high school, like twenty or like freshman year of college, 2016, 2017, started like listening to live shows, first with uh ladies and gentlemen, the Grateful Dead. And that was, that, that was like my first, you know, like live dead that I listened to back in like 2016. So got into it after that. My brother's a musician and like, he loves the dead. We've been like, and now we play, you know, we, we, we both play guitar. So we play a lot together. Um, Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Exclusively dead. So we have a good time doing it. Does someone sing? I sing a bit. Yeah. Do you sing Jerry and Bob? I do. Um, I sing more Bob. I mean, I play rhythm too, so I lean towards Bob. But I play some Jerry as well. I, I sing some Jerry as well. Why do you play rhythm? I mean, how do you guys decide who plays? Because my features? my my brother's nasty at guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so he's yeah, just... like it, it, it was easy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and yeah, he like drums is his main instrument. He's just like musically gifted, so he can shred on guitar too, and. By like 2018, 2019, we were both like, I had gotten him into the dead. So we picked up the guitars and started like acoustic. But do you try to play like Bobby? Oh, yeah. So, like his yeah. unique style, you try to emulate that? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the main thing right now is like getting, you know, just a ton of inversions of, you know, Bobby plays like an A chord, you know, 12 ways along the neck. So, like, just like, playing a ton of different uh, inversions of each chord is a big uh, part of his, his rhythm guitar game that I try to emulate. 
how many times more difficult is that than just playing the good rhythm guitar like you know keith richards would or something uh, i can't really speak on keith richards but when people say when people say like a normal rhythm guitarist it's uh i mean it's a lot it's you know it could be a lot more simple probably makes it a lot more fun yeah right on mike thanks very much for coming on for sure thank you bro so garen jason and jake are fighting for two spots in the best of three series and the winner gets the shop post a prize pack let's hear the song Okay, the guesses are in. It was Shakedown Street at the Hippodrome in Paris on October 17th, 1981. That was actually a leftover pick from Professor Eric Malin's episode, so thanks so much, Eric, for that. Jake and Garen got it exactly. Jason guessed 83. Not a, not a bad guess, Jason. Tough one to go out on. Let's go to Jake, who, who punched his... Guess in after like 15 seconds. What did you hear there that gave it away? Uh, Brent, Brent's, Brent's piano. In 81, he was playing a beautiful Fender Rhodes, like a early 70s Fender Rhodes. Uh, or at least that was the essence of it. And uh, that's just in the pocket, early 80s funk, grease. You know, the minute you hear that, you know it's over. But how are you able to narrow it down to 81 exactly? The, the groove is 81, but I mean, yeah, 82 was 82. The piano he was playing sounded like an acoustic piano, but it was synthetically built. 81, he was still playing like that, like funky 70s uh, Fender Rhodes. So on a, on a tune like Shakedown Street, it's easy. But like I said, it's the only shit I listen to. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. Um... Garen, were you picking up on the piano too? Is that how you got it? Yeah, the Rhodes was a big part of it for sure. Um, and then when Jerry came in, you know, in 80, he still had this very delicate kind of fragility, this sweetness to his voice. And he's, he's, he got a little more ragged as the 80s progressed, you know. Um, and so I heard that and I said, okay, this, that's really what tipped me from 80 to 81 was hearing, the, hearing his vocals. The other thing, uh, if I could just add in there, is that, you know, that envelope filter sound, that wah, that obviously is so signature to Jerry, it's really not uniform throughout his career. There's different versions of it. And that one is particularly organic. Like, that's like the, like, OG wah <laughs> stuff, you know? It's, it's hard, like, yeah, I mean, even though he continued to use that tone throughout the 80s and 90s like there were there were variations you can sort of hear that that's like the, the old 
the real organic or analog version, you know? So what part of Jerry's rig was changing over time that had the side effect of causing the wah to evolve? Well, I mean, towards the, t around 88, 89, when MIDI came in and um, just the availability of a lot of more synthesizer technology and emulations, you could sort of get those tones without lugging, first of all, as much heavy stuff around, but more reliable, I mean, it was sort of regarded as more reliable at the time because um, the analog gear would, would break frequently. You can make the argument that it sounds better, richer, you know, has more depth to it, more complexity, you know, flavor. It's almost like wine or something. But, uh, but yeah, they gravitated more towards digital stuff in the late 80s. Um, and now when we listen back to it, at least to my ear, it's not, you know, it doesn't hold up. But that's when that's when I saw the majority of my shows. So, you know, obviously I have an affinity for it, you know, but yeah. That's a brilliant answer. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Jason, you guessed 1983, two years off of an 81. A very, very noble way to, to duck out. Why'd you guess 83? Well, I knew it was going to be the, either the early 80s or the mid 80s are going to take me out. And so <laughs> here, here we are. Uh, I went with 83 at the very end when Jerry started singing. I, there was something in there that I, it sounded sort of like mush, mush mouthy. And I was like, that's later than where my brain had been listening to just the musicians play their instruments. And so that's, that's how that happened at the end. I was like, I'm just going to go later. Something about the way Jerry's singing it. So there you go. So, well, first of all, how'd you get into the dead? And how did you and Garen together end up starting Queer Deadheads? It, getting into the dead thing is a little bit of a two-parter. When I so when the dead played uh, Lake Placid in 1983, uh, we lived up very upstate New York, a little town called Malone, which is 40 minutes from Lake Placid. And this these kids in a bus had broken down in this park that was across the street from our house. And our dog got run over by a car weirdly that day. And we got home from, I don't know, we're at the mall or something. And these, these hippies, which is how my mom referred to them, like came over there and like, we didn't have any money, but we've been taking care of your dog. It got run over by a car or whatever. And so that was like the end of that story. We rushed up. Fast forward uh, to when I'm 18, a friend of mine and I, he's a deadhead. So we start talking about the dead and we start talking about, Lake Placid to the Sugary in 1983 or something comes up. And the next thing you know, I'm like putting this whole story together. I'm like, oh my God, those fucking people were deadhead. This is crazy. <laughs> and it sort of like drew me in from that point on. And, and he had put a help slip Frank on from, a, a, well, the uh, 5977 version on a mixtape he made for me. And I remember just being sucked into it. And that was, this was uh, 1994. And I mean, Every day since 1994, I've listened to Dead in <laughs> one form or another. Yeah. Awesome. So, how did Queer Deadheads arise? Uh, well, I mean, Garen definitely has at least half of that one, but um, essentially, so I had a previous boyfriend and we were at a bar in San Francisco and he came running to me. He's like, Oh my God, this kid here is wearing a steal your face uh, on his shirt. And, uh, Gary and I sort of end up hitting it off and going in separate directions. We still very close friends with this other guy, but you know, over the years, we just kind of built a community of gay people who are really into the dead, which is kind of a minority within a minority community. And then when the internet hit the grateful dead, were actually a huge part of the, the early social media stuff with well, and all of that kind of stuff. And there were like queer deadheads, floating around very early back in the late nineties, people were going around shows, handing out the little pink triangle stickers that said, ain't no time to hate, which was a, had queer deadheads around the outside. But we started a Facebook group. I don't know. It's at least 15 years ago or so now, just because there was this community of people. And we knew a couple hundred people that were friends of ours, just in our social life that would be like, would reach out to us or hear that, you know, we were part of this group in San Francisco. So we started this Facebook group and it's sort of taken off. I mean, there's maybe 1800 members or something like that. And there's, you know, meetups at everything from a Phil show at the cap to a big 
uh, stadium show at City Field or something. I mean, there's a it's a really active community of people who uh, is something special about feeling like, oh, I'm not the only gay deadhead, basically. And that's kind of the, the heart of it. Karen? Like Jason sort of alluded to, it got going initially, I think, in the early 80s, um, but then hadn't really crossed over into the social media world. And that's sort of where we stepped in and sort of took over the reins of an idea that had already been going a little while before. So we sort of pressed play on the social media part of it on Facebook and Instagram. And there's also a um, complimentary group in the fish world called Brian Robert. Uh, which has been going for a, quite a while too. And, and uh, you know, initially started, like Jason was saying, you know, online, but then very quickly evolved into, oh, what section are you guys in? You know, it started out with five or 10 people. And then all of a sudden it's an entire section, a very fun section, I might add. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So can you track we, uh, down? Sorry, Jason, go ahead. I would just say we we one time at on the floor at City Field at a dead and company show, I somehow got this like eighteen foot retractable flagpole into the building or into the stadium, and we had this steal your face with a rainbow basically inside the skull face made into a flag, and we were sort of holding it over our heads for our friends to just show like if you're on the floor, come with us. And we ended up taking it down because all evening people are coming from across the stadium. They're like, I have to take a picture with you. My daughter's trans. She's at home. I want her to know. And they, she, they would like take pictures. I was, we're crying and everyone around us is crying. It was like, it turned into this whole situation of people really wanting to connect to that part of their life and, and the Grateful Dead, which is obviously extremely important to everybody who's into it. What is it about the Grateful Dead? Is it like the community, the melodies, the lyrics that to you felt like a beacon of love and acceptance? I mean, I, I could venture and answer that. I thought a lot about this. It's like the, the collusion of things that happened in my life. I mean, I basically came out of the closet, discovered LSD, and went to my first Dead show and within, you know, first several years of each other or it, with maybe within a couple of years. And I think the combination of psychedelics and the lyrics and the sort of freedom that the music suggested, it was almost impossible for me to stay in the closet with those influences. It's sort of like I make the joke that the Grateful Dead kicked me out of the closet and it's not far from the <laughs> truth. You know, it's just like there's so much truth in the music and so much integrity. How can you really be into it and, you know, be not honest with yourself, you know? It sounds like LSD was a huge factor in all this. I would say so. <laughs> uh, Jason, do you have a do you have similar sentiment? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, what what the the person that I introduced me into the Grateful Dead was the person I did LSD with for the first time, and uh, so there were all these confluences of experiences at the time that were it really you can't. You can't have a secret. I mean, anybody who's taken acid knows you can't have a secret from yourself. It's just like, it's like mirrors on mirrors on mirrors. And, and if you try to hold on to it, you end up having like a bad trip in, a, in like a global sense. So you just have to kind of let go and be who you are. And so, you know, in the Grateful Dead, obviously with um, the storytelling aspect of it really just sort of points back at yourself all the time and there's a self-reflective quality at me anyway listening to storytelling quality of the band and the music and it just pointed to being who you are ultimately i will say that it was not it wasn't easy even though i'm saying that you know oh the dead kicked me out of the closet there were still you know many shows where i would look around and, and not and just feel like you know i was the only person there I, at one point, uh, is it Autzen, Oregon, in '94? I I was I I thought to myself, oh, it'd be a great idea to gather signatures for the gay marriage bill that was on the that was up for a vote that year, thinking mistakenly that the dead scene would be welcoming to that, and it was a real eye opener uh, to me. The responses I got in the parking lot. Now I think back on it, and you know that was. 
quite a while ago and in the very early stages of maybe that movement. But still, I thought the dead scene would be more accepting and it really wasn't. There was a lot of homophobia. Let's put it that way. So deadheads were not ahead of the curve there. Yeah, no. I I mean, there. it's just like the scene has these diamonds, these people in it that are just, they're just full of love and acceptance and they're sort of forward thinking people. But then there's just as many people that, you know, back then that were uh, reflections of where they came from, essentially. And a lot of people did not, you know, grow up with those ideas, you know, but when you find the good people in this scene, it's incredible because they, they're especially good in my opinion, you know. Thank you so much, Jason, for, for joining us and Garen. Thank you as well for hopping in there and helping us explain the whole origin story for yeah. uh, queer deadheads. And that is, they can, people can find that just queer deadheads on at queer deadheads on Instagram, right? And Facebook and Facebook. I'm going to cool. go study up on my 81 European tour. So, uh... <laughs> Bye, guys. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, Jason, thanks so much for being here. This is a really good show down here. I'm really excited to uh, see this best of three series for the... Bring it, baby. Bring it. <laughs> Bring it, man. Uh, shop post a prize pack. Uh, let's play the song. the guesses are in that was the jam of a bird song at oxford plains speedway in oxford maine on july 3rd 1988 nick palmgarten made that selection and <clears throat> clipped that specific part of the jam can't take credit for that thank you nick so garen was closer who guessed 1989 jake guessed 1993 um, yeah, dude, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like so humbled right now, man. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that was bizarre, man. I didn't even, I did not hear Brent at all in that, man. I, did, um, I can't believe that. Anyway, man, that, wow, dude, I'm humbled. It's a, it, it was a tough one. Uh, but Garen, you, you sorted it. How'd you figure out it was late eighties? Uh, there was, there is that, that Brent, that sort of synth piano thing, Bobby's tone was just really like glistening sort of that midi Bobby tone and sort of the groove of the band too. They fell off the horse a couple of times and then got back on. And, you know, also that, that I know that bass sound from Phil too, that, that so it's all just added up to that particular period for me. What was going on with Phil? That Phil tone, I guess I would describe it as particularly active, meaning um, there's analog and there's passive and active in electric instruments and passive would be your more traditional kind of Fender bass sound. And then there's one that's like sort of souped up. It's got especially like when he drops bombs, it's like particularly it sort of almost like saturates your headphones a little bit. So that's what I heard. Sweet. Uh, nice work. Jake, you thought 93. What were you thinking? I, I, dude, I did not hear Brent in that. 
you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm bummed that, that I, I didn't show up. So mad props to Garen, dude. I love to be put in my place. Cause you know, the dead, like, I just remember Garcia talking about, you know, they play 40 shows and they might have 39 clunkers, but they wait for that one magic show. And then that makes it all worth it. And that to me is what life is all about too. Because life is about 39 clunkers, but then you get that one magic thing. Jake, you're kind of a born talker, and it will surprise very few people maybe that you have a, a podcast, uh, The Jake Feinberg Show, and you've had some, you know, totemic, canonical figures from the Grateful Dead universe uh, on it, and it's a great listen. How did you get into the dead, and how did you start this show? Yeah. 98, I heard a cassette, Starlight Theater, 82. Uh, my buddy Matesh hit me to Live Dead. So I didn't ever get exposed to the studio dead per se. It was always the live experience. But um, like I said, I've been marinating in the early 80s. And it's been fascinating as a journalist, as a rogue journalist, to get to – I got to Bobby about 12, 11 years ago because he was coming to Tucson. And I wound up keeping him on the phone for about 45 minutes, which – for most people to say that's pretty remarkable because he's not a big talker. Um, we were able to stretch out, um, but it's been interesting. That side of the dead has been more accessible. I did two interviews with Barlow, one with Weir, interviewed Tom Constantin, did five, have done five interviews with Healy. And like, I've interviewed mountain girl, you know, and I've interviewed all the merry pranksters. And like, to me, like it's very important to always remember that Jerry Garcia really was the Grateful Dead. When they took that year off after 74, all those cats tried to go in, in solo directions. Bobby Bobby actually kind of pulled it off. But the point is that Bill Kreutzman couldn't afford a condo after 75. So in 76, they came back. It was the phantom ship. But yeah, Phil Lesh, man, Terrapin Crossroads, that's a tragedy that that shit got closed after COVID because he was giving young cats an opportunity to play, get their own individual sound, and they got paid for it. Like th th that was a gig. It was a gig. The tragedy of COVID is that that Phil had a shutter terrapin. But you know, you could go into the bar and a grant to the burgers. I mean, th they were fifty dollars. I, I paid for them, but and they were good. But like it was a it was a place where you could bring young families. But you could walk into the bar on a random night, see Reed Mathis. Or see, you know, uh, you know, Phil's son. Yeah, there were great bar shows and there were main shows. But the point is that the cats were getting paid to play live. And that's what's lacking today is the opportunity, the venues to be able to play and the opportunity for it to become gigs. I mean, most road dog musicians today, I mean, it's really hard to play original music and be a road dog today. Anyway. Those cats have healed me and my daughters. My daughter's ears are so wide open. They love digital beats, but they also can hear those drummers. It's like shoes in a dryer, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Garen, before we go on to the next round to see if you can clinch the, the guest of the year title, could you tell us how you got into the dead? Um, well, I'm the youngest of nine kids, and there's a big age differential between uh, me and them. So. When I was in grade school, the stuff that I thought was cool, none of my peers had heard of, you know, so I was into the dead and CSN and Dylan and, 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 uh, you know, Joni Mitchell, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, yeah, so I had heard that stuff from the periphery a lot growing up and then started really getting into it in when I was about like 13, 14 and, um, the Dead were playing. That was when they did that first long multi-night run at MSG. So it was like September of 87. I think they did nine nights. And uh, I asked my dad if I could go, you know, and he said the only way he would let me go is if him and my brother, who was the resident deadhead in the family, went with me. And so given that choice, I said, sure. It wasn't what I wanted, but I said, <laughs> yes, you can come with me. So my dad and my brother went with me to what's now regarded as a pretty awesome dead show. 
I mean, I think it's really become sort of the guiding, probably the primary guiding principle in my life. If if you could say the dead is a principle, and I sort of do. I mean, it's it really permeates every part of my life. Um, professionally, I am a guitar player. I play in a, a dead band at the capital region of New York called Gratefully Yours. And I also, I don't, it's just been such a huge influence on on everything. How do you approach life? How do you, I mean, there's the obvious one for me, which is music, but the metaphorical part of it is wide reaching. You know, like I mentioned before, just about being yourself and being open in your life and, um, you know, embracing improvisation in all of its many forms um jake touched on it a little bit which is just you know there's a million tries and maybe only one bullseye um but even if there's never a grand success it's just about embracing not knowing what's coming next and and thriving in that because fighting against that is really probably pretty futile because that it's the nature of existence in life is that you don't know what's happening and it's an illusion to pretend you're in control and the dead world. That's what that music was all about for me. It's like there, you know, Jerry was pegged as being the leader, but um, he would never, he never accepted that role in any interview you hear with him. He's always pushing that concept away, you know, and he wants to be thought of as part of an organism and um that's what we are in life i guess is part of a, a larger uh organism and we just do what we can and i imagine that improvisational ethos extends to your band uh gratefully yours at its best it does yeah it's interesting i don't we're not um we're not super slavish about copying you know, you want to get the tones right and you want to get the approach right. And then what you do inside the music, our approach is really just to try to be yourself as much as possible. Deadheads are into authenticity. I know that there's there's people who want to hear every note perfect and there's bands that approach it that way. To me, I've never quite understood that. I don't think Jerry would would uh, really support that, actually. You know, I'm, not, I'm not denigrating any of the incredible dead bands out there that do that. Because it's an it's awe inspiring, really. You go see DSO and stuff. To me, it's just jaw droppingly good. But I don't know that Jerry would would be so enthusiastic about that. Don't sleep on Grateful Shred, dude. That's the best. Car, that's the best band out there, dude. They're fantastic. Yeah, they wipe the floor with wipe the floor with Jay Rat. So let's move on. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, they are great. Um, Garen, where can people yeah, hear uh, your band? Do you guys do you guys release live sets? So gratefully yours, we we play pretty much exclusively all over New York State, but we so we're in the city, we're upstate, we play and and sometimes in Connecticut, New Jersey. But um so that's basically where to find us. And we play a lot. So um I think gratefullyyours.net is the website, but it's we're all over social media and stuff like that. And then I do um before long before I got involved with those guys, I've I've played with them for a couple of years. I've been doing my own original music, and that's just under my name. So I, I write songs and sing and play guitar. And how can people find that? The website is just Garin dot com. So it's G A R R I N dot com. Far out. And, when did you get that? And uh, uh, about two minutes before somebody else did. In like 1997 or something? Yeah, it was like 99 or 2000 or something like that. Jesus, that's huge. So, that's awesome. Yeah. So cool, Garen. Thanks for sharing all that. And you are up 1-0 in the series, and Jake needs this one to tie it up. You need this one to win Guess the Year.
the guesses are in. That was a China Doll Jam at Winterland on December 29th, 1977. Garen was closer in 79. Jake guessed 84. Garen, you're the new champ of Guest of the Year. Congrats. What were you hearing there? That was, I found that to be like a really great selection, like very challenging. So I was hearing that that harpsichord thing and it sounded like a synth harpsichord. So I was like, okay, maybe it's Brent. Then Jerry's tone and the band sounded so, so late 70s. So I was like the only year that Brent was playing with them in the 70s was 79. So that's why it goes 79. But yeah, I should have maybe gone with the what I was hearing in Jerry, which was definitely 70s, you know, so. Uh, that was a Nick Palmgarten pick again. That was a good one. Jake, you're shaking your head. What are you thinking? <laughs> yeah, who is this Palmgarten cat, man? Because right. I'm sick. I'm going to freaking yeah. wring his neck, dude. I'm going to freaking yeah. wring <laughs> his neck. First of all, Keith's way low in the mix, so it was so hard to hear. And so it could have been mistaken as Brent, and we didn't get to hear Jerry's voice, which on a China doll is essential. So, of course, I'm whining about this. But but it was no, it right. was very really hard. It, it was re- I mean this palm granite's cat I'm gonna I'm gonna find it dude because he's pulling out some good shit man and, and, and to be honest with you it's been so like I am so grateful to be here because I started hot but man I was woefully off and like that's the other thing about the dead is that you know to me I never saw the Grateful Dead ever. And to me, it's a fantasy, and I want to keep it that way. Because like you talk about these, not you know, the shows in Vermont, all the fucking chaos in the '90s. I wouldn't have wanted to see the dead in the '90s. You know, it was a kind of a mess. You know, but I'd rather keep it as a fantasy. And you know, at the end of the day, um, I just it, it's what it, what's great is you can walk away from a show, and you can be introspective, and you can think. And you can know that your soul has been blown open. And I can feel that just from the live shows. You don't even have to go and see them live. And in fact, if I had gone to see them live, I'm not sure. Maybe I'd be more disenchanted based on some of the anarchy that went down. But either way, way off on the gig, way off. I mean, just like, you know, and and, and it was because I could not. Keith was playing some silky, funky shit. So way off, man. Sorry, bro. Humble, the humble. You know what's interesting though is that like you you reference the dead as a fantasy and and any era where I wasn't there is that way for me. It's it's this gauzy, I imagine what it was like kind of thing. And and then now in the YouTube era where like these early eighties shows are popping up all the time on YouTube and I'm like, oh my God, like that's what Boreal Ridge looked like in eighty five. And you know, it's like I had this these ideas of what the Greek was like in the eighties and all this and you know, it's sort of this demystification thing. But sure, uh, sure. I, to- I totally relate to that idea. Love it. Thank you so much everyone. Jake, nice run. Garen, congratulations. That was fantastic. Um all right, we'll Subscribe to Guest of the Year on Apple Podcasts and Spotify for all the show links, including our new YouTube channel, which is going to have real video content on it. Now, right now, we have all the, the episodes with a nice animation, but I'd subscribe because we've got a good YouTube thing coming up soon. For all those links, go to guestoftheyear.net. And if you want to be a contestant on the show, sponsor the show, or make comments and ask questions, email us at info at guestoftheyear.net. Thanks so much to Peter. He he's a great guy, as you can hear on the show. He's also just a great artist. So yeah, I would check out his, his site, shop-posta.com. It's also linked in the show notes. Thank you so much, Peter. Keep up the great work. I think I have all of Peter's shirts. I wear them constantly. So yeah, thank you, Peter. Shout out to Dylan for drawing the posters and Mason for curating the set list. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to the amazing tapers whose recordings made this show possible. Congratulations to our new champ, Garen. And to our other contestants, thanks for playing. And remember, it's all one song anyway. And I bid you good night. Good night. Good night. And I bid you good night. Good night. Good night.